Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode on the Web3 Academy podcast. We are doing a deep dive today on blockchain trilemma. I am Kyle Reedhead, host of this podcast, uh, and I'm going to be reading a new newsletter uh, or article that goes out in our newsletter, uh, and that is called The Blockchain Trilemma Explained. It was written by Raul, um, who is also the tweeter for uh, and social media person for Web3 Academy. Um, but we talk a lot about blockchains, and <clears throat> it's time that we explain what the blockchain trilemma is uh, and where this industry is going to fix it. Now, before I get into this, I just have a quick ask from you listeners. If you are listening on YouTube or Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please just go and click subscribe or follow. Um, that way, it helps the algorithms uh, and helps us grow. It helps put our podcast on the top list. So that other people like you can find our podcast and learn uh, all about Web3 as well. Our goal here is to keep you on the forefront of Web3, help you understand how to use Web3 in business and with community. And we want to make sure everyone is getting that opportunity. So please go and subscribe or follow. Uh, but without further ado, let's dive into this episode, uh, The Blockchain Trilemma Explained. Web3 is going to reach the masses soon. There is no doubt about that. We talk about that all the time. However, blockchain tech is simply not yet ready to support the masses. For the promise of Web3 to come true, we need blockchains to support millions of transactions per second. To put this into perspective a little bit, Bitcoin currently supports five to seven transactions per second and Ethereum about 24. We need millions. We're at double and or single and double digits. So like we said, we are not quite there. Now, scalability on its own is not the challenge. We can definitely scale blockchains. The real challenge is scaling blockchains while also maintaining security and decentralization. If we can't do that, then we're back where we started with centralized databases in the first place. Achieving security Scalability and decentralization is an issue that most blockchains are confronting with right now, including Bitcoin and Ethereum. Now, this is called the blockchain trilemma, and it is a fundamental problem to crypto in Web3. The ultimate goal of all blockchain teams, so layer ones in particular, is to solve this trilemma. But how do you reach ultimate security, scalability, and decentralization under one umbrella without failing miserably like so many do and so many have. Well, in this article and in this podcast episode, I'm going to try and break down what the blockchain trilemma is so you can understand how it can be solved in theory and how important it is that we do indeed solve it. So let's jump right into it. And by the way, this comes in the back of just a few days from now, we will have the Ethereum merge. Uh, and the Ethereum merge is one of the bigger events to happen in all of crypto and Web3 and while this doesn't help solve the uh, blockchain trilemma of Ethereum, it does set us up for the next phase, which will. Um, so it is very important, but do understand it does not fix, you know, lowering gas fees and that right now, but it puts us in a position where we can in the future. It does other things in terms of the security and the decentralization, um, which we want to optimize as well. So what is the blockchain trilemma? Well, blockchain trilemma is perhaps the most fundamental problem in crypto and Web3, Let's start by breaking down the word trilemma. So tri equals three, lemma equals problem. And that's from the Latin uh, language. So trilemma refers to when there's an argument between three parties, which exclude each other. Therefore, only one must be chosen at all times. So it's not that we can't achieve scalability or security or decentralization. We can do all three of those. The problem is, is you can't achieve all three of them together at one time. That is the issue. So let's just break down what those are. So decentralization, this is consensus is required from more than one party. The more parties, the better. The more parties, the more decentralized, okay? Then you have security, which refers to the steps taken to avoid hacks such as 51% attacks, where bad acting miners try to take over a blockchain or attacks which overload the network causing it to crash. And then you have scalability. So mostly associated with how many transactions per second a blockchain can handle so that once adoption occurs, it can keep its gas fees, the cost to use it low and have fast settlements, right? So we're not waiting 10 seconds or however many seconds for our transaction to actually go through. If you think about when we purchase a coffee, 
you know, we tap our visa card and it happens immediately. We don't have to worry about that. We don't have to wait. Um, we need that in blockchains as well. And so, for example, speaking of Visa, Visa processes 60,000 transactions per second. Well, Bitcoin, again, can only hold, handle five to seven and Ethereum only about 24. What we frequently see in this space are projects excluding one or two of these components, especially at the beginning when they first are created. For example, Bitcoin is very secure and decentralized but it lacks scalability. The settlement times are long and there are no applications able to be built on top of Bitcoin. Um, so it is not meant to scale. It is meant to hold or hodl as they would call it. Solana as another example is scalable and somewhat secure, but it lacks decentralization. The blockchain can support over 60,000 transactions per second or so they say, but the lack of validators makes the project very centralized. Same thing goes for all other projects. Achieving one component implies the exclusion of the other components. So this is why we have such a, a big problem in creating scalable blockchains. Okay, so the question is, how can this problem be solved? Um, well, we have no real implemented proof or framework to go after. We can discuss the already existing technologies that could theoretically allow us to solve the trilemma. There are three options that we'd like to break down today. So the first, the transition from proof of work to proof of stake and we will explain what that means. So similar to what Ethereum is doing at the moment, as I just mentioned, proof of work projects can consider transitioning over to proof of stake, something that allows for faster settlements to occur. However, the biggest unlock of proof of stake is the environmental impact. So proof of stake requires less energy to handle transactions, essentially zero. Um, but you may wonder how that's relevant to the blockchain trilemma. Well, Right now, the mining industry for Bitcoin and Ethereum is industrialized and it costs a sig significant amount to be a profitable miner in terms of mining equipment and energy costs, hence why more and more small miners are actually leaving. However, thanks to proof of stake, you will only need 32 ETH, which equals about 64,000 at the time of this writing and actually at the time of this recording, it's much less. Um, so you only need 32 ETH to become a validator. It also requires essentially no equipment, any basic laptop uh, will do, potentially even like a uh, an iPhone in the future. We're not quite there yet, but it's, it's going to that route. And then it costs limited energy resources. You can just plug this in in your own home. You don't need a, a data center or something. This sum is very small in comparison to what you need to become a Bitcoin miner right now, for instance. Not to mention that you can pool your ETH on various protocols, things like Rocket Pool or Lido, where you'd only need to own 16 ETH to become a validator, making that even cheaper. Uh, I'm not saying we recommend doing any of these with Rocket Pool or Lido. We are just saying it is an option if you want to do proof of stake and participate. So with this in mind, Ethereum is hoping to become more decentralized in the future, thanks to the fact that you do not need a lot of money, energy, or hardware to participate in securing the network. Okay, so just to clarify, validators from proof of stake and miners from proof of work have the same goal. Their goal is to keep the blockchain secured. Now, do not take what's written here for certain. Things regarding ETH's transition to proof of stake are super early. We haven't had the time and experience to learn anything from this just yet. Nevertheless, Ethereum will create a framework and precedent for proof of work protocols transitioning to proof of stake. And it'll be captivating to watch it develop. It already has been. But the moral of the story here is that proof of stake um, can potentially enable more decentralization as more people can afford um, to actually validate the network versus trying to compete with these huge minor um, uh, companies uh, and huge data centers when it comes to proof of work. It also speeds up the settlement layer, um, which allows for a little bit more scalability. So we're sort of we're actually hitting on all three of the trilemma here when we move from proof of work over to proof of stake. Now, just because we're on proof of stake doesn't mean that we've solved it. I mean, almost all blockchains are proof of stake and many of them are not decentralized or secure um, or even scalable to be completely honest. So layer two scaling, this is something we've talked about a lot on the Web3 Academy podcast. So we'll break this down just real quick for you, but layer two, otherwise known as rollups, um, scaling is perhaps the most reliable source through which the trilemma can be solved. Let's take Ethereum as an example once again, as they're the farthest along in this journey. The main Ethereum network is at the moment very secure and decentralized, thanks to all the miners or soon to be validators that are active in the ecosystem. However, due to the nature of the network, Ethereum isn't at all scalable, right? It's only 24 transactions per second. That's no good. 
gas fees are already high, settlement times are quite long, and therefore the user experience sucks when using Ethereum. Now that's where L2s, so things like Immutable, Arbitrum, Optimism, that's where they join the party. And there are many more. There's over 20 something, maybe 30 something by now, layer twos plugging into Ethereum. But layer twos allow transactions to happen off the Ethereum main network in a scalable fashion. So Immutable alone supports 9,000 TPS and it's still very new tech. I think it's like maybe a year old in terms of when it's been launched. Um, and it does this while keeping security high due to the fact that transactions are immediately settled on the main Ethereum chain, often in a bundled or rolled up um, way to avoid paying multiple gas fees. So at today's state, L2s are, are, are those which put a patch on the wound called user experience Ethereum ecosystem. We as users are allowed to mint NFTs, send money and claim airdrops using layer two scaling, avoiding the massive gas fees long settlements, all thanks to layer twos. Layer twos turn a blockchain from a monolithic blockchain into what's called a modular blockchain. So this separates the trilemma. It allows for the layer one to focus on security and decentralization. Well, hundreds or even thousands of layer twos can plug into it and focus only on the scalability. It's sort of the perfect match. And it actually just basically stops the trilemma in its tracks. The trilemma no longer exists because the blockchain is not trying to do all three of those things anymore. It's allowing certain layers to be parsed apart and letting those layers focus on specific parts of that trilemma. So the layer one, again, can focus on security and decentralization, while the layer twos can focus on scalability. The final piece to the puzzle here is sharding. And so I'm going to explain what that is just real quick here. It's a weird name, I know. Uh, but sharding is a mechanism which breaks up transactions into pieces. They're called shards and settles them in parallel with the main blockchain. This maneuver allows for multiple transactions to happen simultaneously, making the blockchain more scalable, so much faster and cheaper. Today, there are already a few blockchains like Elrond and Z Z uh, Zika that have implemented sharding in their mechanism. Uh, Z Zilliqa, I think is maybe the way you pronounce it. However, these are projects which are yet to pick up any steam in terms of adoption and their ability to scale is still put under a question mark. Another criticism towards these projects is often that they are centralized, which is somewhat true, but we have to keep in mind that they are super early and nothing is certain right now. Now, Ethereum's roadmap mentions that they are on track to implement sharding at some point in the coming years. If successful, Ethereum will be on the way to become the first blockchain that solves the, tri the trilemma. Quite frankly, right now, Ethereum is secure and decentralized, but lacks scalability, something that would be enabled by the implementation of sharding itself. The combination of a sharded proof of stake layer one blockchain with many layer twos plugging into it seems like the most likely roadmap to solve the blockchain trilemma. Now, there are others trying to solve it all on one layer. So all on a monolithic blockchain, Solana is really the one that stands out here. Um, and they have had the most success of any of these blockchains in terms of actually getting scalability. Um, they are still somewhat decentralized. So I'm actually quite bullish on Solana and what they're building. I think their team is absolutely incredible. They come from a Web2 world, from Qualcomm and others. And so these ideas of sharding and layer twos, it's not that we, or proof of stake even, it's not that they're the only way to solve the trilemma. It's just really one of the only ways that we know of right now. Uh, and it's what most are working towards and experimenting with and a lot of research has gone into, uh, but potentially there will be other ways. And we'll see as that continues, uh, we'll see what Solana is able to pull off. They're really the only other one that's trying to push the, the norm here uh, and try something different and keep it all in one chain. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but how important is it that we solve the blockchain trilemma? Well, in order to compete with centralized companies like Visa and MasterCard, we need to be able to match what they are offering. Blockchains like Ethereum are aiming to become the settlement layer of the internet. This would not only imply payments, but also all other activities that we are doing in the internet, which is a massive amount of activity. This means we are not just taking on Visa and MasterCard, but also Facebook, Twitter, Google, and more, right? In order for Web3 to support the masses, we need extremely secure and decentralized blockchains that can settle hundreds of thousands or even millions of transactions per second. So this is why I bring up, even though Solana is at 60,000 transactions per second all in one chain, and that's great, and the same as Visa, it's not enough. It's not even close to enough for what we're really trying to do because we're not just trying to be Visa. 
We are trying to put everything on the blockchain, content, your social content, potentially even conversations, our data, our profiles, um, you know, uh, our money, our payments, our equity, our businesses, so much is going to be going on the blockchain that we need 60,000 is nothing. Okay. It's literally irrelevant to where this is all going. So we need to not just match the scalability for centralized companies. We need to surpass it while also maintaining security and decentralization. Until then, centralized companies will be able to offer far better services with far better UX. The bottom line here is we've got some work left to do before we are ready to onboard the masses. The good news is that we have the solutions in theory and in research. We just need time to build and test the tech. I guess the other good news is we also have the funding. That is one good thing about this space. Until then, expect a bumpy road across the space in terms of UX, scale, and security. Guys, it is going to be years until we have Web3 working in a way that is a great UX. And so a lot of people in this space are currently complaining about the UX. It's too expensive to transact. Uh, it takes too long. It's too clunky. It's very confusing. We're probably not going to improve on that for, I mean, we're always improving on it, but it's going to take time. And I think it's still years out before we really can put the blockchain aspect underneath a layer where we have such a beautiful UX that we don't have to think about any of this kind of stuff. So the good news is this gives all of you time to build and create and experiment in the space before most of the masses come in. So you can become uh, an entrepreneur, you can become an expert, you can become whatever it is you want in the space, you have the time. Now that doesn't mean we're not gonna adopt or have extreme adoption over the coming years. Of course we are, we already are, and the UX is as terrible as is. Um, but when we want billions of people to come on, that's when we need to figure out this trilemma. Uh, and I think that's still a few years away, but, all in all, I think we are on the right track. We are seeing some amazing things coming out of the Ethereum ecosystem, coming out of the Solano ecosystem, um, and we'll see what else uh, becomes a relevant factor in this uh, blockchain layer one, layer two sort of um, competition that we're having. Anyway, I hope that you all enjoyed this episode. Thank you, Raul, for writing this article. It was very insightful, very helpful. Uh, and for those of you that are listening, um, feel free to ask questions, tweet us at web three Academy underscore. If you have a question about this podcast, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Or if you just want to give some feedback, let us know you liked it. You didn't like it. Please hit us up on Twitter and don't forget to follow or subscribe on YouTube, on Apple podcasts and on Spotify. I am Kyle Reedhead, host and founder of web three Academy. Thank you so much listeners for tuning in each and every week. I absolutely love having you here and I love teaching and uh, sharing and learning from you as well. Thank you everyone and have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. And if it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. By the way, if you have yet to join the Discord community, you are missing out. This is where all the magic happens. This is where we learn, where we ask questions, where we network. Uh, you want to be in there. The link to join is in the description below. And finally, a quick disclaimer. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.